All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. I know we're competing against some pretty nice weather here, so um, appreciate appreciate you coming out. Um, this is our third and final uh, public education workshop that's uh, associated with our urban forest management plan. I'll just take, make a quick, couple quick points about that, and then I'll turn it over to our uh, our guest speaker here. Uh, the Urban Forest Management Plan is a community-wide planning effort in which the city is going to identify uh, its goals and uh, its vision and goals for the city's urban forest. And as part of that, we're doing a lot of public outreach. This is one part of it. Um, and we have some boards, by the way, in the back, which I think a lot of you were able to see that tell you a little more in depth about what the project is and what we're looking at. And there's also a couple opportunities to um, put little stickers to identify what your opinion is, what your priorities are going to be. Um, uh, so, so we're really proud of those. So I hope if you haven't had a chance to look at those that you'll, you'll get a chance to go either um, during the presentation if you need a little walk or, or afterwards as well. Um, so a couple other things I want to plug before we get going here. The first is that we do have an online survey that's live right now that has about 18 to 20 questions ab about all things urban forestry. So if you go to the city's website, you should be able to find it pretty easily. Um, you can share your opinion about what you want the city's priorities to be, whether you want to see more canopy or less canopy, um, how you feel about the city's tree regulations, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we're, we're reaching out. We want to hear what people think, and we're going to try to work that into our plan and all the recommendations that are going to be included in that plan that will hopefully be implemented uh, in the years to come. So, uh, and one other thing I forgot to mention, we also have a photo contest going on. Um, so if you, also if you go to our city's website, it should be on the front page there. We're just looking for people's photos of their favorite spots uh, in the Sammamish Urban Forest. And we're gonna use a lot of those, we're gonna end up using a lot of those in our final plan document. And one lucky winner who will be voted on by the public uh, will receive a $50 gift certificate to get some native plants for their own house. So that's very cool and exciting as well. Um, so with that, uh, I will turn it over to our guest speaker here for our Tree Care 101 workshop. Um, Bob Layton is the district manager for American Forest Management, and he's also a contract arborist here with the city of Sammamish. Um, he's an International Society of Arborio or Arboriculture certified arborist and has many, many years of experience uh, doing this kind of work here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, one point of order before I turn it over. Um, Bob has a lot of great material to go through here this evening, and I want to be respectful of everybody's time and, and stop, uh, stop at or close to eight. So he'll stop a couple times throughout his presentation for questions, and then again at the very end of the presentation as well. So if you have a burning question, uh, hold on to it, and he should be able to get to it uh, within a matter of minutes. Uh, so with that, I'll introduce you to Bob. Hello, everyone. A couple of disclaimers up front. Uh, public speaking does not come easy for me. I'm way outside my comfort zone right now. See, I'm an identical twin, and my brother was lucky enough to be the extrovert. <laughs> so. And a second disclaimer is I don't know everything there is to know about trees. Uh, trees are complex living organisms, and I'm still learning new stuff all the time. And I think that's what I enjoy probably the most about my job. A little background on myself. I was actually born and raised in South Florida. I uh, didn't see mountains or snow until I was 18. I went up to a little forestry school in the Adirondack Mountains of New York. I came out here in the, to the Pacific Northwest in my early 20s uh, for work. Uh, never really intended on staying, but I just fell in love with the mountains and the trees and a girl named Julie. And, uh, so almost 30 years later, here I am. And I started um, my career doing timber inventory work, a lot of timber cruising. Um, then I started, then I went to work for a consulting forester's office. I've been a consulting forester now for 25 years, and I started doing consulting arborist work in 2003, so about 15 years now. Uh, it was an easy transition because uh, the trees I was looking at out in the woods were the exact same species that I was looking at in people's backyards. And I knew a lot about them, and it was an easy thing for me to transition to. So, so we got a lot to go through. The city's asked me to talk about four topics, uh, best management practices for home tree care, identifying and managing for tree disease, 
identify and manage native species and, and selecting trees for different types. So for best management practice, I think the most important thing we can do is know when our trees need water. You know, landscape trees probably suffer more from moisture related problems than any other cause. They usually have too little or too much. Providing water to our trees when they need it, uh, it's an easy thing to do, and it's probably the, the best thing we can do for them. Um, we've had some pretty serious droughts here in 2015 and then again last year. And so really all the, all the tree needs is a good deep soaking once every couple of weeks or so during that drought period. You know, a lot of people have uh, sprinkler systems and irrigation systems, but uh, that water is pretty much used up by the lawn. The tree's not really getting a lot of that. So when you water, you want to water deep. You want to make sure the water's getting down a good foot into the ground. So. Trees, they generally live a very long time and they thrive under conditions of stability. Change, however, in pretty much any form represents stress for trees. That could be transplanting, pruning, pest management, uh, fertilization. Uh, these trees here, these are Douglas fir trees that I've been looking at for, for a long time now. Now that development's probably 15 years old. They ch kind of changed the hydrology when they built the development and those trees are getting a lot more water than they used to and they're slowly, they're slowly dying. Drought stress, we've seen a lot of drought stress lately. This is a young Douglas fir tree here with top kill from drought stress. This was just uh, last summer, 2017. This could have been prevented, but in this area here where it's landscape, there's no irrigation. Uh, raising the grade around trees. This, this, it's hard to tell from this picture, but a couple feet of uh, fill soils were brought in to level out this backyard and they pretty much buried the tree roots. Fortunately, we caught it early enough and the, the owner or the developer decided to take it all out and put it back to the existing grade. Adding fill around roots, uh, even, even as little as four to six inches of placing fill over the top of, of roots is enough to suffocate them, you're, you're disrupting the, the oxygen exchange and the moisture. So you want to be really careful when you're, when you're trying to raise the grade around trees. Uh, lowering, lowering the grade is also uh, not good. This is an extreme example. But most of our, most of our trees have very, are pretty shallow rooted. You're going to find most of the roots in the top 18 inches of soil. That, you know, that de it really depends on the soil types. In deep, loamy soils, they could be significantly deeper, but normally we find most of our roots up in the top foot and a half of the soil. Just something to keep in mind when you're digging around your trees. Another issue we have here, um, sun scald. The sun can damage our trees, especially when we expose them to the sun they're not used to. Uh, the slide on the on the left is a, it was a development uh, opened up the forest, and that's a Douglas fir tree, probably a 30, 40 year old tree on the edge of the the new green belt. Um, the sun just cooked the south side of the tree and, and killed killed all the cambium. In the background, you see another tree that fell over. That was a similar sized tree. It, the decay advanced to a point where the tree couldn't stand up anymore, and it broke. If you look to, to the right of that tree, there's a, a younger Douglas fir, about 15, 10, 15 years old, and it has no sun scald damage, but that's because it grew up after they cleared. The cedar on the right, a lot of sun scald damage at the base of it. Uh, the new development, they cleared, took all the brush away from the base of it and, opened, and exposed it to the sun. Sun scald is, is common on thin bark trees, like young conifers and most hardwood species that have thin bark. 
Here's another example of, of sun scald. There's both winter and summer sun scald. In the winter, the sun warms the south side of the trunk. You get a, you get a, a mild day, the sun comes out, it warms that south side of the tree trunk. And then night falls, temperatures drop below freezing, and the cells that were awakened are killed. And so you get a die back of the cambium or the bark on that south side of the tree. Summer sun scald is, is, occurs when the sun heats up the cambium so hot that the cell, cells start to die. Oh, we haven't had much issues with that in the past, but it, we are starting to see hotter, much hotter summers. Uh, you can, on newly planted trees, you can prevent sun scald damage with a, with a trunk wrap. Uh, you can find this in most gar garden stores and, and tree, tree supply stores. You want to use a white wrap and not a, not a brown or a dark colored wrap. Another issue with our trees here is uh, we have a lot of sap suckers and some sap sucker damage. That's a big Norway spruce. It's been uh, hit pretty hard. Again, most of the thin bark trees are susceptible. Birch. Um, I see. I see uh, sap sucker damage on cedar too. Um, if you have a young tree and it's getting damaged and you, and you want to protect it, you could. You could easily protect it with a wrap of some sort. Uh, just need to keep it on for a couple of weeks. The bird will get used to not going to that tree, and then you can take it off. But probably a couple of months later, he'll be back. So you have to do it again. Uh, soils and soil compaction is another thing to think about when you're taking care of your trees. Here they put a, put a new house in and they're running heavy equipment up and down the side there next to that uh, big fir. Here what they did to protect the soils, the surface roots and to prevent soil compaction, they brought in about an eight inch layer of hog fuel or mulch on top to run the equipment over. They could also use plywood or steel plates, but hog fuel is probably the cheapest way to go. Pruning, we could spend all day on pruning, but I just wanted to cover some of the highlights. A pruning can be beneficial or harmful. It, it really depends on the timing, the intensity, and the quality of the pruning program. This is a before and after picture of some cherry plums that were pruned. Good pruning job is when, say you, somebody's doing a crown cleaning for you, they're removing the dead wood, the weakly attached branches, you know, the sucker growth. A good pruning, you, it's hard to even know somebody was in your tree after they're done. Structural pruning is, is, is important, especially when you're planting new trees. Um, if, you, if you correctly prune your trees in the first five years, they shouldn't need any pruning for a long, long time if you set, up, set them up to develop the right type of structure. These are, these are problems here. Um, closely spaced, weak V-shaped attachments. You can see the V, like on the slide on the left, you have the two stems forming a V. You can already see a seam developing between the two. Uh, if you let that tree grow, those are gonna continue to split apart. You get a lot of, called embedded or included bark builds up between those fork stems because the tree can't put an annual ring around it. The bark gets pushed out. Decay advances in between the fork and eventually it'll split apart. That's a red maple on the right. A young tree, probably only about 10 years old. That, that stem on the left, if that was pruned off and the tree was much smaller, it would be a, just a little wound and, and you'd have a nice straight tree. But that tree's about ready to split apart, the one on the right there. How to make a, a proper pruning cut. You know, this is just base, basic natural target pruning. Um, you know, you really wanted the most important thing is to protect the branch collar and the branch bark ridge. There's three cuts involved. You make your undercut first. 
all the way to the left. Then you make your top cut a couple, an inch or two beyond your undercut. So the limb snaps off and you don't, basically you don't want to peel the bark off because if you don't make the undercut, something like that might happen where it peels the bark all the way off. There's an example of the, the branch bark ridge and the branch collar. Which, why you want to protect the branch collar is there's, there's different chemical properties in that wood that helps, that helps the tree respond to wounding and seal off decay. Here's, here's a tree that was properly pruned. You can see how the wound almost completely closed all the way to the right. Here's a tree properly cut on the left. You have wound wood all the way around it. And then on the right, it looked like the, the branch collar got nicked at the base so the wound couldn't clo fully close. Tree planting. Just a couple highlights about planting. You want to make sure that the, the width of the, the top of the planting hole is about two to three times bigger than the, the tree you're planting. You want to set the tree on undisturbed soil so it doesn't settle. And you want to set it a little higher than the existing grade, you know, an inch or two above the existing grade. If it's got burlap or a, a wire cage on it, um, you want to if it's natural burlap, you can just cut that or the wire about halfway off and leave the rest in the ground. If it's like a, a synthetic burlap, then you want to remove the whole thing or plastic. Now, tree staking. A lot of times when you plant a tree, it really doesn't need to be staked. If it does, uh, you just you don't want to leave it on too long. Here are this the little Leland cypress that was planted. It's, uh, that strapping is girdling the tree. It's been on there way too long. Here are some trees that were recently planted and staked incorrectly. You can see the slide on the left where the tree is being pulled to the left. And when you took the staking off, that's where the tree naturally wants to stand. And that's actually straight up and down. When, we, when you stake a tree, you want to give it, say you're uh, planting a one inch diameter tree, you want to give it about three inches to move all the way around. So it can develop, uh, basically, we want, we want it to move a little bit when the wind blows it so it can, the roots can respond and grow where they need to grow. I wouldn't leave staking on a tree any more than a year. I would take it off. If, if it looks like the tree's still unstable and moving, put it back on for another year, then take it off. But if you leave it on too long you, and you take it off, the tree's not accustomed to the wind and uh, could have problems that way. Okay, that's the end of section one. Any questions? So just quickly, I'd ask Bob, I'd ask you to um, just repeat the question so that it gets so it gets on the, on the microphone so we can pick it up. And I just, I forgive me for not mentioning this before, um, but both a video of this presentation and the slides will be available on our website. So you don't have to worry about writing everything down or taking pictures of everything. Like, uh, like leaf litter and yeah, guff and stuff? Yeah. I wouldn't think so. What kind of trees are they? They're too big. I wouldn't think so, no. Yeah. Unless you wanted to. Yeah, well that's, yeah, that's fine. I'm, I'm talking about when you you don't want to raise the grade and bring in uh, like a foreign material, like a, a fill you would buy at a, at a, you know, at a yard and garden store or, 
if, when you do, if you do want to raise the grade a little bit, make sure that what you're putting down is, is really friable and, and has a lot of pore space in it. And probably mulch is the best thing to raise the, if you wanted to raise the grade of the mulch, yeah. Everybody hear the question? Uh, the rule of thumb is you can remove up to 20% of the foliage uh, at any given time. Um, pro the thing about uh, raising the crown on trees, the tree is going to put on more diameter growth where it has live branches. So if you raise the crown, you're going to get more growth up top where there's you'll get a little bit down here, but more up there, and so your trees will grow taller and skinnier. That's why, like when in a forest, in a, in a managed forest, you know, all the crowns are way at the top because all the trees are competing with each other and the, the, the lower limbs all get shaded out and die. And so they grow really tall and skinny is what the forester wants them to do. But if you have it dug fur near your house, you want it to develop good structure and you'd rather it be shorter and fatter than taller and skinny. Yeah, yeah. Wind sailing? Wind sailing. Is that yeah. a good practice? Uh, there's times when, when it's, uh, it's warranted. Like if, if you have, uh, say, you, say you got a big fir next to a house that was recently constructed and they had to remove a bunch of roots. Uh, you've, maybe the, the stability of the trees been compromised a little and you really like the tree and want to keep it, then, then wind sailing, yeah, it would reduce the load on that crown. Uh, I, I don't recommend it normally. Um, it tends to remove too much live foliage at one time because what they do is they go up and remove a branch from every whorl as they go up the tree, sometimes more. Um, it can send a tree in a state of shock if you remove that much foliage. And also you open up the crown to more wind and you might get in the near term, you might get more branch failures than you would have if you didn't, if you wouldn't have done the pruning. I did so. wind sailing, and I used to get so many huge branches. I had huge Douglas firs, uh -huh. and then after the wind sailing, no more branches falling down. Oh, good. So I'm happy with that. Yeah, we're going to talk about Douglas fir and, and branch failures coming up. Last question. No, normally it's just it, that south side of the trunk. The bar. What? How to prevent it? Well, yeah, it it could over time. Um, you know, once that cambium dies, uh, the bark dies. It, it doesn't grow back. So you've got an open wound there where decay can advance into the trunk. Over time, you know, like those little Norway maples I showed you, uh, over time the decay will advance farther into the trunk and probably compromise their stability. They'll probably, they probably won't make it to, to a mature you know, status. Okay, let's talk about some of our more common tree diseases we have. I would, I would say this, I would say even in the best growing conditions, trees may become unattractive, grow slowly, or succumb to disease and die. Uh, this tree diseases is a big topic, and we could talk hours about it, but I'm going to hit on the highlights that we have around here. Powdery mildew, fungal disease, pretty prevalent in our region. Fortunately, it doesn't last very long. Once, once we warm up and dry out, it goes away pretty quickly. This is this is more of a cosmetic thing. It, it's not really hurting your trees. It's not affecting the tree's health. Uh, brown rot, uh, flowering cherries. Flowering cherries here are difficult to grow. We've got lots of issues with them. Uh, brown rot is very common. 
fungus causes a blight of flowers and twigs. It, this, this disease affects most of the stone fruits and pear trees as well. Verticillum wilt, another common one here. I see it a lot on Japanese maples and our native vine maples. This is actually a, a, a soil-borne fungus. Causes yellowing, wilt, scorch, dieback, and decline of most woody plants. The stem on that slide on the right, I don't know if you can see it, there's a, that stem, that red stem, there's some black in the middle. That's the, that's the infection. Anthracnose. We have, a, we have a big problem here with our dogwoods and anthracnose, another fungal disease. If, you're gonna, if you like dogwoods and you want to plant dogwoods, you're going to want to look for a, a, a resistant, anthracnose resistant variety like the Kusa. How do we manage for fungal disease? Cultural methods would be to prune out the dead and infected branches. Rake and destroy all fallen leaves from spring to fall. Don't irrigate the leaves, the canopy. Probably the most, the, the biggest one, the best one is choose disease resistant cultivars. There's been a ton of work developing new, new tree species, trees that um, are more resistant to our common problems. And then there's always the chemical side uh, I, I rarely recommend uh, chemical treatments um, just because it's, it's, it's a hard process. You really got to stay on top of it. It requires several applications, um, probably more, more, more than the homeowner wants to take on. Some of our more common pests that we have. Uh, Probably the biggest complaint I get is uh, these trees are dropping a, a sticky substance all over my car, and we don't know what it is, and we want to take the tree out. Well, it's the aphids. Aphids are eating the leaves and excreting what they call honeydew, and it, it drips uh, on the cars, on the roads, driveways. It's a, it's a, it's a mess. And I see a lot in oaks, oak trees, and London plane trees. The hemlock woolly adelgid, another common one we have. If you have a hemlock, you've probably got some of these. Uh, another, another basically cosmetic issue. They're not really hurting the tree. Um, if it gets really bad, you, you, there's some some things I'll, I'll tell you you can do for it. Uh, Cooley spruce gull adelgid. A lot of that around here on our, on our native Sitka spruce. I've got it on my Sitka spruce. That I've always had it ever since I moved into the house. Uh, the tree's healthy and doing fine. The little, the little larvae on the right there, he'll uh, burrow into a new, a new bud on the tree and, and that, that gall will develop. It looks like dead foliage, but it's not. It's really like a, it's a round gall. It's a spiky gall. Another one is the Douglas fir sequoia pitch moth. I see this a lot on the pine trees we have here. Sometimes Douglas fir. Normally you'll find it uh, near a, a branch that was pruned off or a broken branch. Another one, the damage is usually minor and mostly aesthetic. What happens is the, the, the moth will land on the bark and lay eggs. The larvae will hatch and bore into the inner bark and they create this large pitch mass. You see it there on the right. The larvae will pupate inside that mass and then the moth will fly sometime in the summer, and they take about a year or two to complete their life cycle. So after, there's the larvae on the left after the pitch mass was pulled off the tree, and that's the moth on the right. It looks kind of like a yellow jacket. Uh, despite the name, sequoia trees are not affect, affected by the, 
by this past. And then another one um, more recently has become a big concern here, bronze birch borer. Um, it's been a, it's been a, they've had it on the east side of the Cascades for years and years and years. And we didn't really, it wasn't really an issue for us, but probably in the last three or so years, it's become a big concern. It's really hammering our birch trees. Uh, we're getting a lot of die back, a lot of die top kill. There's the beetle on the right and the entry hole there on the left. The beetle will get behind the bark and lay its eggs and the hatched larvae will then feed on the cambium, moving through it and creating uh, what they call galleries. Die back starts at the top of the tree and works downward because the transport of water and nutrients has been interrupted or ceased entirely. So there's the galleries, bark beetle galleries. That's the bronze birch borer on the left. On the right, that's Douglas fir beetle. So all the larvae originate from one point. They spread out. They work their way eating through the cambium, basically killing the cambium in that spot. Douglas fir beetles, uh, they're here, they've always been here, they're not really an issue. Uh, Douglas fir beetles normally don't attack healthy trees, they will attack trees that are on their way out, already, already stressed and in decline. Normally bark beetles are a secondary issue, they'll attack stressed trees, but not the bronze birch borer, it'll go at, right after healthy live trees. Another favorite is the western tent caterpillar. Uh, I'm sure you've seen them, the big massive cat nest, caterpillar nest. They're, again, they're more of an annoyance or an aesthetic issue. Not usually a concern unless there's a, a large outbreak in a single tree. Uh, I have seen them where you have you know, numerous nests in one tree where they'll completely defoliate the tree, eat all the leaves on it. How do we manage for pests? Again, most pest issues are aesthetic and not compromising to tree health, such as the aphids, alligators, pitch moths, tent caterpillars. Significant infestations of aphids and alligators can be treated with a, an insecticidal soap that you could get at any lawn and garden store. The problem is when they get high on the tree, it's hard to, hard to get the soap up there. The tent caterpillars, uh, best thing to do is just prune off the limb that they're attached to and submerge it in a bucket of soapy water or, or burn it. And then the beetles in again. Okay, that's the end of that section. Questions on pests and disease. It depends on what it was. Uh, well, you might you you may very well have some root disease issues in your neighborhood. I don't know. But is there any way to treat it? No, if they're infected with root rot, there's really nothing you can do about it. There should be, are, is it, are these in a landscape yard or are they no, in? No, they're not in a landscape yard, they're in a property yard. Okay, so they're, they're on a wooded forever. site. They're on a wooded site. The problem with root, with root rot diseases is the, the trees don't give you clues 
until they're in the advanced stages of the disease? Well, it depends on uh, what disease it is. Um, like if it was arm malaria, you'd have heavy resin flow at the base of the tree. You'd be pitching out a lot of sap around the base of the tree. Um, well, most dug firs do, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, if it was Schweinitzii, uh, you'd have um, fruiting bodies of the disease at the base of the tree, and it's really advanced. I'm going to get into this later. Um, yeah, so hold that thought. We'll talk about Any pest or disease issues? Questions? Yeah. How about ivy? Ivy? Yeah. I mean, I have trees that have quite a bit of ivy. Yeah. Ivy is. Um, it's not really affecting the health of the tree. Are these? It depends on what they're growing on. The biggest problem with ivy is it grows up into the crowns of trees. Like, uh, it doesn't really hurt the dug firs if it's growing on the stem of a dug fir. But if it gets into your hardwood trees, your maples or, or whatever, and it gets high in the crown, it adds a lot of weight up there. Yeah. And that that the weight of the ivy can cause branches to break or even even pull trees over. It's the weight issue of the ivy. They're not, they're not really impacting the health of the tree. Yeah. But and they're also, the ivy is also crowding out probably other native vegetation that you'd like to have, but all you have is an ivy. I like the ivy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The spruce, yeah. Are you talking about the? The galls? Yeah, the overgrowth. Uh huh. The coolie yeah. spruce gall, all good? Yeah. How to treat it? Um, how bad is it on your tree? I would just prune off the galls and. Yeah, just the, the, in, the, the insect is in the gall, so if you just prune off the gall and get rid of it, uh, it's not going to make it go away completely. It's, it'll probably keep coming back. Even if you sprayed it um, a couple years later, you'd, you'd have it again. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend spraying it. Uh, I would just prune off the galls. If you don't like the way they look, I'd just prune them off. And yeah, well, it's, uh, you won't see the galls anymore. Technical <laughs> uh -oh. Okay. One last question on duty. No, once they're attacked, they're pretty much goners. It might take a few years. Do you have that problem? I see in my neighborhood. I mean, some people cut them down, some people leave just a couple of branches. Yeah. I, I don't yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, I see the damage everywhere. Um, I wouldn't recommend planting any birch trees in the near future. I don't think. <laughs> Uh, you can wait it out. Um, it's probably not going to take very long, especially with you have like recent top dieback. Or, yeah, it's probably not going to take too long, a year or two at the most, probably. All right, let's talk about our native species. So our, I think our six most prevalent are the Douglas fir, western hemlock, western red cedar, big leaf maple, black cottonwood, red alder. We have a lot of others, but they're much more, uh, less common. Some of those on the bottom you might have in your yard, scalar willow, cascara, bitter cherry, sitka spruce, short pine, western white pine, grand fir, madrone, Oregon ash, Pacific dogwood, Pacific crab apple. Did I miss any? <laughs> Douglas fir, a 
fast growing, loves the sun, will not tolerate the shade. Long lived tree up to several hundred years can attain heights of well over 200 feet. Bark is smooth, blistered and light colored on young trees, becoming deeply furrowed, thick brown as it matures. Here's the cone of the fir, very unique cone. No other tree has a cone like it. It has these three pronged woody bracts that stick out of it. Uh, the way I learned how to identify this tree was that uh, the cones look like little mouse traps. See the mouse, see the, the tail and the back legs of the mouse sticking out of there? <laughs> Douglas fir traits. Likes to shed limbs and damage gutters and penetrate roofs, and usually during strong wind events. Here you can see this tree here. It's lost a couple branches on the left side of the crown. Why do they shed branches? A um, lot of different opinions about it. Some will say they, they do it on purpose to prevent them from blowing over. Uh, I think, I think that branches, they, they just grow too long and heavy. You can see the branches drooping on that tree. Uh, those are about ready to break off. Nothing you can really do about it, just a natural characteristic of the tree. I get complaints about it all the time. Um, it's just what they do. Cambial ruptures, also very common on Douglas firs. If you've got a big Doug fir, you've probably got a cambial rupture on it, maybe. Uh, these are caused when the top of the tree or the crown is heavily loaded by wind. That force is set down the trunk. And the cambium layer will split open. You'll get pitch to come out of it. There's a recent, recent one on the right and, a, and some older ones on the left. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're not, they're pretty superficial defect. Uh, every, every good wind event that, that'll reopen and you'll get fresh pitch seeping out on top of older dried pitch. Uh, not, a, not a big deal. I always, when I see these, but I always want to check the other side of the tree to make sure we don't have an identical one on the other side. Because we could have a sure crack. If we had a seam like that on one side of the tree and an exact on the other opposite side, we could have a sure crack where the tree actually cracked in half. I don't find those very often, every once in a blue moon. Crooks and forks in, in Douglas fir. Um, I don't see much, many issues. They're usually, fork Douglas firs usually have pretty s solid attachments. They rarely split apart. Uh, Crooks, that tree on the right there, the top of that tree probably broke out when it was much smaller and grew a new top. There's a bisected uh, section of it. Pretty sound, even trees, you know, a lot of topping took place uh, 10, 20 years ago. A lot of Douglas fir trees were topped and Grew new tops. Um, we used to think those were weakly attached. Uh, we're reconsidering that that notion. I rarely I rarely see them fail after they've been topped. Um, firs, unfortunately, are very susceptible to root rot, especially the laminated root rot. It's probably the most damaging. There's also our malaria, and gnosis, and schweinitzii. The tree on the right is, this is an area where there was a lot of our malaria in the fir. Uh, these diseases kind of, uh, they have different, different ways they affect the tree. Our malaria will, you get a lot of resin flow at the base where it's pitching out, but our malaria doesn't really decay the root. It kills the root, but it doesn't rot it. So the structure stays intact. The trees will die, uh, and eventually they'll lose a top section, a little piece at a time, until you're left with a snag. And you know you're in an area of, of our malaria when you have a lot of standing dead trees. Laminated, on the other hand, will will go to laminated and then go back to furniture. Laminated, on the other hand, rots the whole root ball. Right away, and a lot of most 
99% of the time the tree will blow over. Laminated root rot, it's, it's a disease of the site. It's in the soil. Well, they're all in the soil. But as long as you've got the host species there, the, the, the laminated root rot pathogens are, are going to be there. The only way to get rid of it is to get rid of the host species, which are fir and hemlock, and plant other species like cedar or hardwoods that are resistant. Hardwoods are immune to it. Cedars are resistant. Let's go back to Schweinitzia. Schweinitzia, we find a lot, a lot around here. That's we call it the. It's also called the cow pie, cow patty fungus. Or, uh, it looks like uh, that's a, 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 a newer fruiting body of the fungus on the left, and an older one on the right. Usually, when I find them, they're pretty old. They're black and crumbly. Um, Trinitia has a root and butt rot, where the where the rot will actually advance into the butt of the trunk, um, causing brown cubicle rot. If you have one, you know, if you had one conch near your tree and it was a few feet away from the trunk, probably not a big deal. You probably got one root that's infected. If you got conchs all the way around the trunk, probably all the roots are infected, and you have decay in the trunk itself. In advanced cases, the trunk will actually swell because of the decay inside. What the tree's doing, it's trying to put on, put on more wood where, where it's needed to support its structure. That's what trees do. They're self-optimizing structures. They'll actually grow wood where they need to to prevent a failure. I'm sure we'll get lots of questions about root rot. Western hemlock. Moderately fast growing tree, likes moist but not wet areas. Long lived tree, 200 to 400 years old. Can reach heights up to 200 feet. This is our state tree. And it's identical by that characteristic droopy top. There's the bark, rough, gray brown, not nearly as thick or deeply furrowed as Douglas fir. Cones are small, egg shaped. Pendants around an inch long, short, blunt tipped leaves, kind of a flat sprays of foliage. Very shade tolerant, can grow beneath the canopies of other trees. Here you see it growing beneath the older Douglas fir stand. Likes to grow on top of uh, nurse stumps and old down logs. Unfortunately, it's also susceptible to root disease. Mostly laminated and, and anosis, also our malaria. Uh, not really affected by Schweinitzii. Here's an our malaria infection on hemlock. You can see all the all the black pitch around the base of the tree where it's it's resin soaked. Hemlock's also susceptible to frost cracks. You can see that seam running up the tree. That's caused by extreme, extremely cold temperatures. The cambium will split. Frost cracks are not good if you're wanting to sell the log to, to make forest products out of. Mistletoe, dwarf mistletoe, hemlock. Uh, I, I have this on my property. Uh, the mistletoe it causes branch swelling and prolific branching. They call them brooms. It's a, what it is, it's a parasitic plant that grows on the tree and it robs the tree of water and nutrients. Advanced infections will move from the, from the branches into the main trunk, uh, weakening the wood, the wood structure and, and could cause it to fail. Western red cedar, my, here's my favorite tree. Medium growth rate, extremely long lived, 1,000 years or more. Tolerates wet sites, resistant to root rotting pathogens. Can tolerate wet sites, but not too wet. Um, I've, noticed, I've noticed quite a bit of cedar 
cedar mortality where the, the water table has risen um, and, and pretty much drowned them. So they like it wet, but they can't have it too wet. They don't like, they're not like cottonwood. Bark reddish brown, thin and stringy, cones round, look like little woody flowers. Seeds are tiny and, and in the fall they're dispersed by, I don't know if you've ever seen the uh, cedars release their seeds in the fall. It's like, uh, it's pretty cool to watch actually. Like thousands of little tiny things floating in the air. Mm -hmm. Cedars, uh, moderately shallow root system. Thing with cedars is they have a, they have a really dense, fine root mat that's right at the surface, right under your lawn. You know, it's made up of these little fine, tiny roots. And those are the roots that take up all the water and keep the tree healthy. You know, I, unfortunately, on a lot of sites where they save cedar trees, they come in and they grub around them. You know, to put on a lawn, and they, well, they tear out all that fine root mass and the tree slowly dies over the next 10 years. Uh, cedar traits, we have what we call cedar flagging here in the fall where the inner branches will, will turn brown and die. Uh, this tree is just basically shedding older parts that it doesn't need anymore. This is natural. Uh, every fall I get calls from People who are new to the area thinking their cedar trees are dying. <laughs> so, normally they'll persist for a little while until we get a good windstorm and they'll all blow out of the tree. Like I said, cedar is resistant to root rotting pathogen. But despite that, they still develop a they still can develop internal decay. And, and most of the older cedars do have internal decay, a decay column inside. Uh, not really an issue as long as the tree's healthy and keeps putting on more sound wood every year to compensate for that decay. I rarely, I've rarely seen a cedar completely collapse at the base from, from in, internal decay. Doesn't happen very often. We're going to get to that. Here's a cedar that uh, unusual failure, uh, growing right next to a creek. Basically, the root system was restricted by the creek and was all on one side, and the tree just got too big, and one little wind pushed it right over. See the root, the buttress root there just split. Fork tops in cedar, yeah, they're a problem. See a lot of uh, fork tops split apart in cedars, especially when the forks are co-dominant or equal in size. Very important if you have a young cedar tree and it's growing two tops to cut one of those off. Here's a cedar that was either topped or it's lost, had several broken tops. See a lot of these. Uh, these are these are pretty sound because the stems are not co-dominant. One's always more dominant than the other. They call these candelabra tops when you have a cedar and then it forks into like five or six or eight or ten tops. Sun scald with cedar is a problem. I see it all the time. You know, if you've got cedar trees and you're thinking you want to clear out the blackberries around them or whatever, be aware of that south side of the tree. If the tree's not used to the sun, it, it can burn and the bark will die back. So if you do want to get rid of the blackberry, I'd suggest planting something else quickly or do it, <laughs> you know, to shade that trunk. Big leaf maple, Acer macrophyllum, large leaves, Fairly fast growing, especially when young. Moderately shade tolerant, can live up to a couple hundred years old. Can live in the shade, but doesn't do so well. Likes the sun. Barks gray and smooth when young, becoming thicker and furrowing as it matures. 
hanging clusters of yellow flowers in spring. Right now, they're in their glory. They're everywhere. You can see them. Very important uh, food source for honeybees this time of year. Seeds are a double samara, which grow in joined pairs in a V-shape. They're like helicopter seeds as they twirl to the ground in the wind. Um, bark is very unique in that it's, uh, it can host epiphytic plants like licorice fern. Bark is very moist and calcium rich. It makes suitable habitat for those, for those epiphytic plants. These plants don't harm the tree at all whatsoever. Uh, maple traits, just like the cedar, very prone to co-dominant stem failures and forks. You know, many of our maple trees have developed from cut stumps, past cut stumps, so you get multiple stems, like a cluster of stems. Uh, this was one of them. One of the stems split away. They just, those, as those stems grow, they just press tighter and tighter against each other, and they get. You get decay advancing in between them. Like this, this forked one here. This is a problem. This one of those is going to go eventually. Oops. Branch failures are also common in maples, especially when you have that V-shaped attachment. You can see the decay where inside where the tree split off. And you can see on the, on the stem that's leaning towards us, you can see the, the included bark or the embedded bark that was push, being pushed out between the stems, the big, how it's pronounced it is. You see that? It looked like, if you're looking at the side of the tree, they look like pig ears sticking out of there. The diseases maple susceptible to, Cretchmeria dusta. This is a soft rot fungus. I see this everywhere. If you've got a big old maple on your property, good chance you've, you've got it too. Um, not usually a concern if you just got a little bit of it. If, if you've got a lot of it all the way around the tree, um, you might want to have it looked at. On the left, that gray patch, that's, the, that's a new fruiting body or a recently formed fruiting body of the fungus. And on the right, that black patch, that's an older one. Basically, it turns black like charcoal, lumpy charcoal. You, you look like somebody put asphalt on your tree. But it's, it's the fruiting bodies of Ketchmeria. Decay occurs as a centralized column in the roots and trunks. There's an advanced infection of it. You can see all that black on it. Uh, big leaf maple is also affected by uh, our malaria root rot in our area. I see it every once in a while, not very often. This is a uh, Ganoderma. Aplanatum on big leaf maple, really common. I find it a lot. They call this the artist conch. It's got that white fleshy underside that you can actually sketch your name on and it'll, it'll persist, it'll stay there. If you have a lot of, a lot of uh, Ganoderma conchs around your maple, you, it's something to be concerned about because it, it turns the wood makes the wood kind of white and spongy. It just rots away the complete structure of the wood. But I have a, a, a friend who's a certified arborist. He runs a nursery. And he's got a monster big leaf maple in his front yard. And it's got Ganoderma conchs all over it. And uh, pretty close to his house, too. But he, uh, he's seeing how long it'll last. And it, <laughs> It's, uh, as far as I know, it's still there. I looked at it about 10 years ago. Uh, I've noticed quite a bit of big leaf maple decline over the last five, five years or so. 
They're not sure why the DNR, Department of Natural Resources, have been studying it, trying to figure out why. Don't know if it's drought or a bacterial or fungus, fungal issue. Uh, they, think, they think it might be a, a bacterial problem called Xylella fastidiosa, uh, which, which uh, it affects the xylem of the tree, the water conducting cells, and restricts water to the upper crown or top of the tree, causing dieback and eventually killing the entire stem. And I, I've seen a lot of damage consistent with that, where you, the cambium dies and then the, that, that part of the crown dies. Black cottonwood. Here's my least favorite tree. <laughs> Extremely fast growing, tolerates wet sites, produces cottony seeds in late May, early June. Grows very tall and straight for the most part. Fortunately, has weak, weak, brittle wood. Also likes to drop branches. Could live up to about 200 years or so in the right conditions. Bark is very thin, light colored on young trees becoming super hard and deeply furrowed on mature specimens. Young, young stand of cottonwood on the left and a more mature stand on the right. You see how many branches they have when they're young and then as they mature, they've got only, only the solid 30 branches are left on the mature one. One thing about cottonwood, um, springtime, they're sucking up uh, enormous volumes of water. And uh, we see a lot of branch failures in the spring when that water starts getting up into the crown. You know, the tree could have been weakened over the winter by a windstorm and partially had a partially broken limb or and then you get all that water up in the tree and then here comes the branch. Here was a, a cottonwood that was a, had a fork top and they both split off. Here's another failure that I looked at not too long ago. This was an unusual one. It had, it broke mid stem. It had this odd, odd growth around it. I, I, trying to figure out what caused that. I've seen it on other trees that haven't failed yet. And I'm wondering if they're risky. I'm assuming they are, the way this one failed. Cottonwood's also susceptible to armillary root rot. Um, but pretty, pretty disease free. One of the issues with cottonwood is uh, if you got it growing down in like a wet spot where the soil has become saturated or inundated. Um, and we had, we had a good wind. The trees could blow over because it's the soils that fail. It's not the tree roots. Uh, there's no friction in the soil when they're saturated. And that's why you see in wetlands a lot of times trees will blow over. Red alder. Red alder is a pioneer species, very fast growing, pretty short lived tree only about maybe 60 to 80 years in favorable conditions. I often see it decline in, in, in a much shorter time. Alternate leaves, coarsely toothed, uh, light colored, smooth gray bark. Bark doesn't really change much over the life of the tree. Uh, once thought of as a weed tree, it's now a pretty highly sought after wood for furniture, cabinetry and specialty uses. Alder bears both male and female flowers on the same tree. The male are the long cylindrical catkins in the bottom right. And the female are those woody strobes. Highly uh, prolific seed, produces a prolific amount of seed all over the ground. And, and uh, when you come in and disturb a site, uh, this is what you get, you get a, a a lot of alder coming back just because of all that seed in the ground. As soon as it's scarified and exposed to sun, it takes off.
unfortunately, a lot of alder develop in this type of condition where they are heavily competing with each other for sunlight and space, grow way too tall and skinny, very poor trunk taper, very weak trees when they get any kind of snow or ice or, or wind. Red alder, they naturally decline from the top downwards. And they normally sh shed a top section at a time as they die back. Rarely do they blow over or collapse at the trunk. They'll, they'll decline until all that's left is a short snag. Alders, they fix nitrogen in the soil. They can basically take it out of the atmosphere and convert it to a form that can be used by plants. It's not really the alder itself, but it's a bacterial endophyte that grows in symbiosis with the alder. The bacteria are found in those little orange nodules on the roots. That's kind of a blown up microscopic version. See the alder, the nitrogen rich alder leaves are shed each fall, quickly decomposing to fertilize the soil. And basically the alder's job is to prepare the site for, for longer lived species to come in and take over. Okay, done with that section. Questions? Questions on our native species? Um, well, it's hard to say without seeing it, um, but I, I have an idea what you're talking about. You have a double double trunk tree; they're yeah. really tightly spaced at the base. Yeah, and it's a little twisting around itself. So some of the bark would start to fall off of one side, mm -hmm. and start to crack off into the other. Really, it's only like a foot or two. Yeah. What does the What does the crown do? I mean, what do the stems grow away from each other? Or are they yeah. growing up into one yeah, crown? Yeah. Well, well, I don't want to say anything without seeing it. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, I know. Um, well, what do you but, think about cabling? Um, I think cabling serves a purpose. It depends, uh, you know, if you, had, if you had a weak attachment and you saw, saw signs of it splitting apart and you really liked the tree and wanted to retain it, then, then yeah, probably pruning, a combination of pruning to reduce the load on that weak attachment and cabling would probably be a good idea. But you could send me a picture of it and I can look at it and I can't guarantee anything. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. No questions? Let's move into our last segment is uh, how to pick a right tree for your property. There's a ton of information online out there about this. Uh, this is from the Arbor Day Foundation. A lot of them have to do with utility lines. You know, they want you to keep your trees a certain distance from the utility lines. There's really, there's really good genetically modified cultivars that are perfect for planting underneath power lines these days. There's a lot to choose from. These trees don't grow any taller than 15 or 20 feet. They can grow in like small planter strips. And here's another one, kind of a similar example.
One of the things you got to take into consideration when you're planting a tree is, is how big the tree is going to get, you know? I see, uh, I, uh, way too often I see now that, you know, they're planting Douglas firs, you know, five to 10 feet from new, from houses because they want the landscape to look kind of mature when they sell the house. But here was a tree that was planted way too close to the house and it's, uh, this is only about a 10 year old tree and it's already grown into the house and odds are the owner of that house is gonna to wanna to get rid of that tree. If it was planted another 10 to 20 feet back farther from the house, it could probably develop into maturity. You know? So taking into consideration mature size is uh, important. I don't think I'd plant a tree any closer than about 20 feet from my house or about 12 feet from my driveway. Rate of growth is another consideration. Fast growing trees are usually short lived, weak wooded and subject to branch and stem failures. You know, we talked about that with the alder and the cottonwood, birches, willows, poplars. Weeping willows are beautiful trees. They just, they need a lot of room. Consider tree form or growth traits. All different types of trees. If you don't have a lot of space, you could use a columnar or a pyramidal variety. Here's a cut out from a nursery ad. These are Norway maples. You can see Norway maples, they come in all different shapes. An upright spreading on the top left, an upright oval on the bottom left, pyramidal to oval on the top right, and columnar there on the bottom right. Another thing to think about is the maintenance, future maintenance. You know, trees are messy, no doubt about it. You know, remember that honey, the honeydew issue I told you about earlier? Yeah. Trees will naturally shed parts at many times of the year, from leaves, seeds, cones in the fall, to bud scales in the spring, and flowers and fruit from summer to fall. I've got a monster uh, western red cedar close to my house and what a mess it makes. In the fall, I can't keep up with it, trying to keep the gutter clean. But I, but I love it and I'll put, I'll, uh, at this point in my life, I'll, uh, I can clean up after it. I don't know in about 20 years from now. One last thing I wanna leave you with, I think is, you know, trees don't live forever, trees die. Just a fact, no matter how much uh, arborists and well-meaning citizens try to deny it. I think trees are, trees are very similar to people in a lot of respects. They, uh, the older they get, the more, the more problems they develop, you know. Trees grow really fast. They put on a lot of growth and they're young, but as they mature, growth slows and they start affording more resources to preventing disease and pest infestation. And then at some point, they just can't keep up with uh, the stresses and they begin to decline and senesce. Yeah. Just the way it is. Well, I went through my presentation pretty quick. We got about 15 minutes for questions. Anybody uh, have any? Go, go downstairs. No, no, they're healthy. Um, you know, if you, have, if you have 
overextended lateral branches that are growing out really long and beginning to droop and sag, those, those are at the highest risk of, of snapping off. And the branch will usually snap off within a foot or two of the main trunk. And unfortunately, sometimes they come down like spears, you know, and they go right through your roof. Uh, if you can identify those branches, you can, you know, hire somebody to go up there and prune them back or prune them off. Um, but if you have a Doug fir and it's got, you know, it doesn't have overextended branches, the branches are kind of growing up like this and it's a nice compact crown, I wouldn't worry about it. Oh, the fork tops of the cedars? No, not even the fork tops. They don't snap. I mean, they're big. Oh, they snapped at the base? Well, not the base. Maybe five feet up, maybe ten feet up. Branches, the whole tree. Oh, oh, big. Yeah. Well, the, yeah. I mean, is there any way to I mean, cuz I have one that's big. Well, as long as the tree is healthy and and vigorous and and is growing, um you know, if it more than likely, a, a large cedar does have some decay inside. It's just a natural phenomenon. They'll develop a decay column. As long as they're putting on new layers of sound wood every year, that that should compensate for that decay inside. And you know, the decay will advance slowly, but that extra growth. So I, when I, that's the thing I look for. If if I know I've got a cedar that's got a lot of rot inside, and it's stressed and it's not growing, then I would be more concerned. But if it's healthy and growing well, I tell, yeah, I wouldn't be concerned about it. So you said that the trees that don't have the branches, that they branched up, uh -huh. is that true of cedar too? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because like what happened to our neighbors, you know, the big wind storm we had 10 years ago or so, all the trees snapped, but the houses we built right next to the trees were the branches. Yeah, that's pretty much true with every evergreen tree. They'll just they'll put on more diameter growth where they have live branches. Tree grows in the in amongst other trees and then they're removed, so it's out there standing on its own. Is it much more vulnerable to the wind? Definitely, yeah. It depends. Um, you know, if you have a grouping of trees. Um, those trees on the south or southwest side of that grouping are what we call edge trees, and they take the brunt of the wind forces. And so they've, they've felt that wind as they've grown, and they've laid down the sufficient roots to keep them stable. The trees in the interior of the grouping, they never felt the wind. They didn't need to develop any big anchoring root systems, and they don't have them. So when you take off your edge trees, trees on the south, southwest side, and expose those trees inside, there, yeah, there's a pretty serious risk of them blowing over. Yeah. Large cedar dropping big branches. Right? Large cedar dropping big branches? Big branches. What kind of, are like, are they like leaders that have come out and grown up like this? Or? Well, like this one, you know, came out and they fell out. I wish they had done it like yeah. seven, eight feet long. Yeah, those are, I wouldn't call those regular branches. Those are more like leaders that have grown off and kind of developed in the branches. And yeah, if they get too big, they will break off. Yeah, those probably should have been pruned off a long time ago, but they weren't, so yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll break off. Hold on, I got, he was a,
are they Douglas firs? So you had a row of evergreens that were top, yeah. and they're all. And how how when they were top, how big were they? How, how big were the top? So a pretty good size cut. Yeah. Yeah, that's. Uh, I I be I might be a little concerned myself. Um, yeah, if they're true firs, uh, I'd be less concerned if they were Douglas firs. Uh, true firs, they tend to rot a little faster than Douglas firs. They don't compartmentalize decay as well. Um, when I say compartmentalize, um, when a tree is wounded. Um, we call it compartmental code it compartmentalization of decay in trees. The trees will uh, there's chemical properties in the cells, and they will uh, we call them walls. They build these walls that prevent the spread of decay both inward and up and down. And some species compartmentalize decay very well, like Douglas fir, um, and some don't, uh, like true firs. But it, that, that looks like a pretty big cut, a topping cut, and so it's a pretty big wound. So up there where they're growing new tops, you've probably got significant decay up there, which makes those weak, those, those new stems. So I'd, have, I'd, I'd recommend having them checked out, or just, you know, maybe it's time to plant something else there. Uh -huh. No, I wouldn't say they're more at risk. No. No. Same same probably risk as a tree growing on flat ground. Yes. Well, it depends on on what you have. Um, you know, if you have, if you if you got, say, you had root disease issues on on or near the property, you know, you might the arborist might recommend coming back every couple of years. If all your trees were healthy and in good shape, you might not want to come back for five years. So you know, tree conditions will change over time gradually. Um, but that's the way I do it. If there's issues I want to keep an eye on, I recommend I come back in two to three years. If there's not, I tell them uh, I don't need to come back here for five to seven years or so. so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't have any issues with it. Um, Probably unrelated. I would, I would, I wouldn't cut them now. Oh. Uh, a lot of, a lot of, there's a lot of uh, nutrients coming up into the tree crown, a lot of sap. So if you cut them now, you're going to get a lot of pitching out of the pruning cut. I'd probably wait about six weeks to do it. Oh, yeah. Oh, winter? Well, winter is ideal because the tree's dormant, but summer's okay to prune. The best times are summer and winter. Spring is, is not good for what I just mentioned, and then fall is not good because we've got a lot of, there's a lot of spores in the air from, from fungal pathogens, and they can attach to your pruning cuts. So usually it's always best in the, in, when they're dormant, probably Which around. Spruce is, red? Uh, is this a blue spruce? Yeah. Colorado blue spruce? They, they could probably go 100 years in our climate, I would think. Yeah, in, in the right conditions, sure.
pruning? Yeah, yeah. Probably the best time is around uh, Valentine's Day. If you're gonna prune. Oh. Well, you it should be it should be pretty obvious. I mean, uh, you can just grab the branch and give it a little twist. If it breaks, it's dead. <laughs> so, <laughs> But if it's a live branch, it'll be it'll have a nice green, healthy color. If it's a Japanese maple, and if it's a dead branch, it'll be more brown, and the bark will be shredding off of it. And, yeah. Yes. Do you have a few sequoias growing on our property? I'm not sure whether they're maple, redwood, or giant sequoias. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, the sequoia and the redwood, they grow really well here. They like this environment. It's actually not a bad tree to plant here because, um, you know, they don't mind the heat. And as we get warmer, um, I've seen, you know, I've measured, gosh, big, big sequoias. I mean, 50 inches in diameter or more. I think they'll grow here a long time. They will, as they mature, Normally, the top will die back, and that more most of the time I think is related to f to freeze damage. But um, and nine times out of ten, they'll grow a new top. Sometimes they won't, but the tree will continue to live on a long, long time. So I think they could go, you know, over a hundred years, easy, probably more than that. Yeah. Uh -huh. I don't, you don't have to, um, you could. I mean, you could rake some off and use it as mulch somewhere else in your yard if you wanted to. No, I just don't know if it would. Somebody else had a question about that. They had quite a bit of duff piling up. Yeah, they do. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, she was wondering if it was a fire, ha fire hazard. It could be, you know, the firework get in there and, um, Yeah. No, I don't see any issues with leaving it. Um, <coughs> yeah. I won't clean it all up. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we're about at time, so I want to thank Bob very much for sharing his expertise with us. Um, I hope it was certainly informative for me. I hope it was informative for all, all of you as well. Um, two uh, quick things. First is, if you're not already on our email list for the Urban Forest Management Plan, I have a little sign-up sheet right here by the water. Um, and second, we'll be at uh, the upcoming farmers markets on May 16th and May 30th with our main project consultant from Davy Resource Group, who will be happy to tell you more about, about our project and the other ways you can get involved. So thank you all very, very much for coming and uh, have a good rest of your evening. And we hope to hear from you later on in our public process. <laughs>